Thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be able to be here. I have always wanted to visit St. Petersburg. So when I had the opportunity to, uh, to come and give a class here and to give a talk at Hydra tomorrow, I jumped at the chance because I have always wanted to get here. For anyone who doesn't know, let me just tell you where Ro the University of Rochester is. Uh, in North America, in New York State, which is the white part there, Rochester is around the middle of the south shore of Lake Ontario, the easternmost of the Great Lakes. Um, the university is a small private research university with about 11,000 students. Um, we are closest uh, in terms of big cities to Toronto, Canada, um, almost 600 kilometers from New York City. So when I say I'm in New York State, everyone thinks I'm in New York City, but it's a very long way away, actually, and I don't get there very often. Um, that's an aerial view of the campus in the foreground there with a bend of the Genesee River going around it. You can see the skyline of downtown Rochester in the distance and the blue at the horizon up there is Lake Ontario. The computer science department at the university has been around since 1974. We are currently about 20 tenure track faculty and 70 or 80 PhD students. We also have a master's program and a large undergraduate program. The department is probably best known for work in artificial intelligence. About half of my colleagues do AI. Uh, we also um, are, are well known in theory, HCI, and of course, parallel and distributed systems, which is my area. I'm going to assume today that pretty much everybody in the audience has some familiarity with shared memory parallel programming, and it would be helpful to me to know a little bit about background. So if, if I could indulge, if you could indulge me, how many people um, have written parallel programs, say, in Java? Okay, great. How many in C or C++? Okay, other languages? Okay, wonderful, good. Um, going to focus for this talk on concurrent data structures such as might be placed in a library, um, presumably written by experts, uh, but if you're going to be one of those experts, this talk is about the techniques that you would use to build the library routines. Um, the assumption is that we want operations on these data structures to execute atomically from the perspective of all other threads. I have a total of about three hours today. I'm going to try to watch the time and get the break where it belongs. This is material that I spend 12 or 15 hours on when I teach our course on parallel and distributed systems. So I'm going to um, try to do the highlights here and uh, hope that you can find the right papers to learn the details for anything where you want to explore in more depth. Uh, my emphasis will be on issues that cut across algorithms, techniques that are worth having kind of in your tool bag um, or in the back of your mind as you look at the specific details of individual algorithms. And it would be really helpful to get interruptions at any point where anything is unclear. Um, they've set the lights so that I can pretty much see all of you, and if, if you have a question, please do raise your hand and ask, and I'm more than happy uh, to go off on, on side tracks where they'll be helpful. For more information on a lot of this stuff, um, you might want to take a look at the book that I wrote for Morgan and Claypool a few years ago, particularly chapters one, two, three, and eight. Uh, this is the sort of book that's mostly distributed uh, as part of a collection to libraries, so if you have access to a professional library someplace, it's probably in there. Uh, and I am currently working on a second edition of that. So why not just use locks? Um, they are the natural way to get atomicity in concurrent programs, and uh, they work just fine most of the time. Uh, the main theoretical answer is thread failure. If um, a thread holds a lock and dies, then no other thread that needs the lock will ever be able to make progress again. And that was the principal motivation for theoreticians to develop non-blocking data structures in the first place. Uh, from a systems perspective, usually we share data among threads that are part of the same program. So all the threads that are sharing the data live or die together, and if one of them dies, all the rest of them die too, and you don't care that the data structure is gone. Um, so in practice, this idea of individual threads dying has not been a strong motivation for systems people. 
Uh, it is possible that that will change, and I have a slide at the end of my presentation today that gets back to that. Um, but in practice, the main reason historically that people have been interested in non-blocking data structures is because they're very tolerant of preemption. Uh, if you're using locks and a thread holds a lock and then is preempted by the operating system and doesn't run for, you know, 10 milliseconds or something, then none of the other threads in your program that need the lock are able to make forward progress while the preempted thread is not running. And that can be a significant performance problem in parallel applications. There are also correctness problems in any system that handles asynchronous events. So imagine that your thread holds a lock and then your program gets a signal from um, a mouse click or something in the user interface or completion of an I.O. request or an incoming network packet and the signal handler needs the same lock. That's an example of priority inversion where the low priority thread, the one that was running before the signal arrived, holds a resource that's needed by the high priority thread, that is the signal handler, and then your system locks up. And non-blocking data structures solve that problem because in the, uh, in the signal handler you're able to use the state of the system whatever it happens to be at the point where the interrupt happened. So. Non-blocking data structures are based on the idea that every realizable state of the system is one in which any thread can make forward progress. There is no reachable state in which a thread has to wait for action on the part of some other thread in order to make progress. So there's a unique abstract state of the concurrent object that corresponds to any concrete realizable state that comes along. You can look at the bits in memory and say, you know, these are the elements that are in my queue, or these are the key value pairs that are in my hash table um, that correspond to these bits in memory, and that's uniquely determined. The typical operation then has three phases. The first phase is figure out what you're going to do in a way that doesn't bother anybody else. Second phase is one individual hardware atomic instruction that makes the operation happen. And the third phase is cleanup. And generally algorithms are designed so the third phase can be done by any thread. Not always. We'll see exceptions to most of these rules, but this is a typical pattern that you see in non-blocking data structure operations. Preparation, single linearizing instruction, and cleanup. So today I want to make sure everybody's got necessary background. I want to talk a little bit about the hardware primitives and memory models that all of this is built on. I realize that some of this has been covered by previous speakers this week, particularly by Danny Hendler. Uh, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to go through that fairly quickly, but I, I do want to make sure that everybody understands the terminology that I'm using. Uh, then I want to talk about some simple objects like counters and stacks and queues. These illustrate some themes that will recur in more complicated data structures, in particular what we call the ABA problem and uh, the issue of dynamic memory management when you have linked structures and you need to create and destroy nodes as part of atomic operations. Uh, then I'm going to, again, fairly quickly, I hope, go through safety and liveness issues. Uh, and uh, that would be probably about where we hit the break, and then in the second half of the class, we'll go through more complex objects, including hash tables, skip lists, and trees. And at the end, I hope to have a little bit of time to hint at uh, interesting research topics that are currently active in a lot of groups. So, the building blocks. Uh, for a long time, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a great deal of interest in algorithms where load and store instructions were the only things that you had atomic. Uh, there was also some interest in algorithms where even those weren't atomic, but people realized pretty early on that if you were building parallel hardware, you did not want a store instruction that could end up storing half the bits, then a load would come along and see half of the new bits and half of the old bits, and then you'd finish your, your store. That would be bad. So hardware has pretty much always been designed so that load and store instructions happen atomically with respect to each other. Uh, then fairly long time ago now, um, sometime in the 70s, people realized that 
they, they needed more powerful instructions that would read, modify, and rewrite a memory location as a single hardware atomic operation. And there's a variety of these atomic primitives available. The one that shows up most commonly in the literature for non-blocking data structures is compare and swap. How many people know what compare and swap does? Okay, so I don't need to go through this in any detail. It says, I pretty I'm pretty sure I know what's in memory. If I'm right, replace it and tell me that you did. If I'm wrong about what's in memory, uh, don't do anything but tell me that I was wrong. And so you can very um, easily write an almost arbitrary read, modify, write operation by reading, applying a function to what you read, and trying to cas it back into the location. And that's the idiom that's in the loop there. Uh, this instruction has been around um, ever since the IBM 370, around 1970. Uh, and that's the Z machines, our IBM successors to that today. They have compare and swap, as does the x86 from Intel or AMD, uh, and the Itanium machines and Spark. The principal alternative to compare and swap, which you find on the other set of modern architectures, is load link store conditional. And how many people are familiar with this? Not as many, okay. So if you don't use x86, this is the universal atomic primitive that you build your algorithms out of. It's a pair of instructions. The first one is a load which tags the cache line as a side effect. It tells you the value that's in the memory location and puts a, sets a bit on the line in the level one cache. And then store conditional will write to that line if the bit is still set. In other words, if you still have the line uh, exclusively in your cache, then you'll be able to, to modify it with store conditional. But if anybody else has touched the line since you did the load linked, it won't be in your cache anymore. That is, if they've written it, then it'll be lost from your cache and the store conditional will fail. So this gets used in a very similar way to compare and swap. You do a load link of some location A, you compute a new value that you'd like to put in, and you try to store that new value to the location with store conditional. And if that succeeds, great. And if it fails, you go around the loop and do it again. This is um, available on a number of machines, most notably today, Power and ARM. Uh, it's also the universal primitive that's available in RISC-V, which is of increasing importance in research and commercially. The, um, the key thing to notice about store conditional, however, is that you could lose a cache line for multiple reasons. It could be because somebody else wrote it, or it could just be because you ran out of associativity or capacity in your L1, or because there was an I.O. completion for some completely unrelated process that caused the operating system to field an interrupt. So store conditional can fail spuriously. CAS fails only if the expected value was not in memory. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. I'm not sure if it actually makes sense, but um, tagging the cache line, does that like require a certain cache coherence protocol to work, or? It requires, typically, that you have an invalidation-based cache coherence protocol. Yeah. So this is a primitive that was designed for machines that already had invalidation-based cache coherence. Yep. Uh, there are other possible implementations, but that's the natural one. So CAS will fail only if the expected value is not present. So if a CAS fails, you know that the value you expected to have in memory was not there, and you can actually reason about why it might not have been there. If store conditional fails, you don't necessarily know that the expected value was not there. Uh, it could be that you had lost the cache line for an unrelated reason. However, store conditional has an advantage, which we will see in a few minutes when I talk about the ABA problem. CAS will succeed if the bit pattern in memory is the one you expected, but is there for a reason other than the reason you expected it. So if what's in memory is bitwise correct, but semantically wrong, CAS will succeed when it should not, but store conditional will fail, and you want it to fail. So store conditional actually has an advantage here. Uh, the fact that both of these hardware primitives are out there in commercial machines is reflected in the C and C++ standard libraries by the presence of two variants of the compare and exchange primitive. Uh, the compare and exchange strong is meant to give you the semantics of CAS. 
Uh, that says, if it fails, you know that the expected value was not in memory. Compare and exchange weak is designed to reflect the semantics of load link store conditional. That can fail spuriously. If you're running on a machine that has load link store conditional, the compare and exchange strong is implemented with a loop in the library. So in the, inside the library, there's a loop that says, if the store conditional failed, we will go back and double check the value that's in memory to see whether it was the expected one or whether we had a spurious failure. So if you need to know and be able to reason about the failure of a CAS, you need to use compare exchange strong from the library. Uh, if you don't care about the spurious uh, failures, then you don't uh, have to use compare and exchange strong. You can use the weak version. Uh, uh, and in particular, if you already have a loop in your program, like the one that I showed in the idiom on the previous slide, then a compare and exchange weak is the one that you want to use in your program. Most published algorithms use CAS. They don't talk about load link store conditional, but it's worth understanding how it's implemented under the hood on a machine that is using the other primitive. And while most algorithms in the published literature use CAS, they don't exclusively use it, and there are reasons why you might want to use certain other hardware primitives. And as I mentioned, there are several of them that are available on various machines. Two of the most important are swap and fetch and add. Swap says unconditionally take the value in memory and exchange it with the value in a register. So I have something in a register, put it into memory, take the thing that was in memory and put it in my register. Um, that never fails. Swap just happens. And there are algorithms where that's all you need. And if you have multiple threads trying to do this simultaneously, having a hardware primitive that always just does what you want means that you can get n threads to perform the operation in O of n time. With CAS, if I want to do a swap, I read, I see what's there, I put it in the register, and then I try to put the value that I had previously in the register into memory, assuming that what I just read from memory is still there. But if it isn't, because somebody else did a swap in between, then my CAS will fail and I'll have to try again. So if we have n threads, and they all want to do a swap, and they have to emulate it with CAS, one of them succeeds, all the others fail and retry, one of those succeeds, all the others fail and retry, and every failing operation takes time in the hardware, and we have n plus n minus one plus n minus two, we have O of n squared time to get all of the threads to perform their operations. So there's a, a fundamental performance reason why you would prefer to use swap if that's all you need. And even more compellingly, fetch and add can be used for things like counters. If I want to count events, uh, and I just want to add one to the counter, then using CAS to do that is distressingly inefficient in the presence of contention, because other threads trying to perform their increments at the same time will cause CASs to fail. But in O of n time, we can get n threads to do an increment, and we'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the end where I can talk about a really nifty Q algorithm that was developed over the last few years uh, that makes use of fetch and add on the x86 to dramatically outperform algorithms using compare and swap. Okay. Then there's memory models. How many people are familiar with relaxed memory models? Maybe about half. Okay, so uh, this is the point where if you've never heard of this topic before, I have to really disappoint you and tell you that hardware does not perform the way that everyone in the world wishes it did and that you probably always thought that it did. Um, everybody wants sequential consistency. First, pull it up there. Sequential consistency says the memory acts as if every operation happened atomically, every load or store, and there was some total order on all the loads and stores in the program history. So it's like there's one big memory and all of your threads are accessing the memory and every operation appears to happen in some order. Um, that's what we'd like the hardware to do and nobody builds that anymore. Nobody builds that anymore because they can get significantly better performance if they allow some surprisingly unintuitive reorderings in both the compiler and the hardware. And in order to avoid seeing that unintuitive behavior, 
you have to put extra synchronization into your code. And normally we don't worry about this because most of us write programs where critical sections that need to be atomic are protected with locks. And we have this nice compact with the hardware that says if all of our shared memory accesses are protected by locks, then we get the appearance of sequential consistency. So if you are writing lock-based code before coming to this lecture on non-blocking data structures, then um, you never have to worry about relaxed memory orders. But if you're actually writing non-blocking data structures, you have to worry a lot about the order in which operations may actually occur. So it's in some sense kind of a mess. There is an intermediate point though that works that is the right place for most programmers. And that's what I've, I've called sort of the sufficient strategy here. Every location that allows a thread in your non-blocking data structure to make a decision, to say I should take this code path or I should go this code path, that's being modified or written by some other thread should be labeled atomic in your program. So you use the atomic keyword in C or C++, or in Java you use the volatile keyword to identify that this is a special variable that's accessed concurrently by multiple threads. If you label all those variables, then basically the right thing will happen. Um, in C++, accesses to atomic variables can be further labeled, individual accesses themselves labeled, with a memory ordering constraint. The default is the memory order constraint sequentially consistent, which means the atomic variable access itself is sequentially consistent with respect to all other atomic variable accesses, and you should do that. Leave the default alone. Just label the variable atomic and the right thing will happen. If eventually, down the road, after extensive performance analysis, you determine that there is a bottleneck that could be alleviated with some more relaxed ordering, then you can label your atomic accesses as something weaker than sequentially consistent. And sometimes this can lead to better performance. But it's extremely dangerous. <laughs> uh, very, very hard to get right. Lots and lots of subtle bugs that have tripped people up, um, things that have gone out into the field and caused terrible trouble three years later uh, have been caused by incorrectly labeling atomic accesses in your program. So don't do that unless you're really, really sure you need the performance and you're really, really, really sure that you know what you're doing. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple concurrent data structure, something a little bit more complicated than the counter that I had up before. Um, suppose I want to implement a stack. So this is an algorithm for a stack that uh, was published in a technical report from IBM back in the 1980s uh, with a lead author named Treber, although I have been unable to confirm that he was the actual inventor of the algorithm. It's generally called the Treber stack nonetheless. Uh, the idea is you have a linked list, top of stack pointer points to the first node, first node points to the second, et cetera, and the last bottommost element of the stack has a null pointer for next. So to push, we allocate a new node. Um, so far this is the harmless prep that doesn't bother anybody else. Uh, and we set the next pointer in that node to point to what is currently the top of the stack. That's more harmless prep. Then we use a CAS to install that new top of stack element. So we switched the top from pointing at B to point at C instead. That's the point at which the operation has happened. If the CAS fails, it means that somebody else did a push or a pop in between the point at which I read top and the point at which I performed the CAS. And if that failed, then okay, the CAS has made the stack different. It has a different top of stack element. I just go back and try again. And I keep doing that until I succeed. Every time I go back, I know that somebody else performed an operation that made forward progress in the system as a whole. My individual thread could have to retry an arbitrary number of times before it succeeds. More on that later. Um, pop reads the top of stack pointer. Um, then it uses CAS to flip the pointer to the next node in the stack retrying if necessary, if somebody else has done a push or a pop, and then it deletes the old node. 
That's the basic idea. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Suppose we have two operations going on at the same time. Thread one starts a pop. So it reads the, um, the pointer from head to A, but it has not yet tried to do a CAS. It's read the pointer from A to C as well, so it knows that it wants to change the head to point to C rather than to A in order to do a pop. But all it's done so far is planning, no actual execution. Then suppose thread two comes along and pops A while thread one is still sitting there. And then maybe thread two um, pushes B. And having popped A and freed it, sent it back to the memory allocator, there's the possibility that a new malloc will return a node with the address of A, which thread two might push. So it's put this node that has the same address, so the head pointer is now bitwise the same as it was before, into the stack, and there's this new node B in between. And now thread one wakes up again. And it does its CAS, which ought to fail, but doesn't. And we end up with the head pointer pointing to C, which is the result of the CAS, but not only have we popped A, we have lost B. And the A that we popped wasn't the A we expected. So there's two nodes that ought to be in the stack that aren't anymore. Uh, and at this point, things are just totally broken. So this is the ABA problem that I referred to earlier. Um, back in the picture here, um, we had a node that was A. It changed to be something else, B. And then it changed to what appeared to be the same thing again, this new A, hence the name of the problem. The location has been changed, but then it's been changed back to something that's bitwise equal. Uh, this problem does not happen if you build your stack with load link store conditional. This is a problem inherent to CAS. Uh, it can be avoided on machines that have CAS when you're building something like the Trever stack using a technique called counted pointers. And these show up in lots of non-blocking data structures. So this is one of the things you want in your toolbox as a general technique for building concurrent data structures. Instead of using uh, instead of representing a pointer as an address, we'll represent a pointer as a pair, a serial number and an address. And the serial number will change every time we change the pointer. So if we want to update the pointer from one node to another, we'll change the bits that are the address part and we will increment the serial number part. And now as long as our system doesn't run so long that the serial number wraps around and comes back to the previous value, and that's easy to do if your serial number is, you know, 32 or 64 bits, um, then we're guaranteed that a CAS will not succeed when it shouldn't because if you've got A back again, it'll be back with a different serial number. The problem with this technique, of course, is that your CAS now has to operate on both the bit pattern of the pointer and on the serial number. And if you want your serial number to have non-trivial length so that you don't have to worry about rollover, then basically you need a double word wide CAS. And some machines have that and some don't. Uh, we can also solve the ABA problem with other memory management techniques, most notably the technique of hazard pointers that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but I'm going to leave that off for now. Uh, for now, just know that, that the counted pointers are a technique that you see a lot. So before diving into lots of other data structures, I want to talk about correctness. Um, generally, we're interested in two things known as safety and liveness. Safety says that bad things never happen. Liveness says that good things eventually happen. Most papers spend more time on safety than liveness. Generally, the proofs of safety are harder than the proofs of liveness, but you should pay attention to the fact that an implementation of your concurrent data structure in which every operation is an infinite loop so you implement every operation with while true semicolon. That is correct in a safety sense. Nothing bad ever happens. Nothing happens at all. Neither good things nor bad things. Your system just sits there. Safety says bad things never happen. So you get safety alone by doing nothing at all. 
liveness is the part that says good things will eventually happen. So we really, really need that too, because we don't want to say that an algorithm is correct if it just sits in an infant loop and does nothing at all. Um, linearizability is the standard correctness criterion that we use for safety. And for liveness, we have several variations on non-blocking progress, which is, of course is the topic of this, of this talk today. Uh, and I'll get to all of these on the next few slides. Yeah. Uh, so in the context of the correctness criteria, um, going back to the stack example, is there some fundamental reason that it should not or cannot be implemented with um, like load length and store conditional or like on an ARM platform, let's say? The, the stack can be implemented with load length store conditional. And in fact, the ABA problem does not arise if you use load length store conditional. Uh, so that's the easiest solution. But if you're running on an x86, say, CAS is what you have. Uh, and you know, it, it's tempting to say, it's, it's tempting to want to be able to say CAS is better than load link store conditional or vice versa, but they're incomparable. Uh, CAS has this ABA problem, but load link store conditional has the spurious failures problem. Okay, so let's talk about safety. Um, Linearizability was introduced back in uh, the 1980s by Morris Herlihy and Jeanette Wing, and uh, it's become the standard correctness criterion for non-blocking data structures. Uh, we say that a history of your structure, that is a sequence of invocation and response or call and return events over time, is linearizable if that sequence of calls and returns, which of course may be interleaved from threads, my thread does a call, your thread does a call, their thread does a call, and then we get some returns. Those can be interleaved that way. That actual concrete history needs to be equivalent to a so-called sequential history in which every call is immediately followed by its return, the way you'd get in a sequential program. It needs to be equivalent to, that is have the same calls with the same parameters, the same returns with the same results as the sequential history, and the sequential history has to be consistent with the thread history in every thread. So I can't count a sequential history where my second call happens before my first call. That would be bad. And it has to, uh, the sequential history has to respect the semantics of the data structure. So I can't use a sequential history in which um, my pop returns the wrong element of the stack. It has to be the element that comes back from the stack that I expect. But if I have this, if I have um, my history being equivalent to some sequential history that's consistent with program order and that's consistent with object semantics, then my history is linearizable. My implementation of the data structure is linearizable if every possible history that can come out of it is linearizable. And that's what I want. I want to be able to prove that every possible history that can arise from executing the code of my data structure will be equivalent to some sequential history that satisfies these two criteria. Uh, the equivalent way to think about this is that every operation appears to happen instantaneously at some point between the call and the return. And that point is called the linearization point. Turns out those two definitions are equivalent and the second one, the linearization point definition, is the easier one to use as a proof structuring technique. So when we're writing a paper, say, about a, a non-blocking data structure or we're building one for a library and we want to convince ourselves that it's correct, we do so by identifying a linearization point in every operation where the operation appears to take effect instantaneously from every other thread's point of view. And that, um, that point needs to be between the call and the return. That guarantees that if my operation returns before you call your operation, then my operation will be before your operation in the equivalent sequential history. That way we avoid problems like my operation comes back, I tell you that it came back, then you call your operation and yours appears to happen before mine, which would be logically unintuitive and, uh, and might give us what the database people would call a serializable history, but it won't be linearizable. 
All right. Um, a key aspect of linearizability is that if I'm able to prove that this data structure is linearizable, and I'm able to prove that this data structure is linearizable, that is, every execution history that uses this thing will appear to be equivalent to a sequential history, and every execution history that uses this thing will appear to be equivalent to a sequential history. If I write a program that uses both data structures, then all of the executions that use both data structures will themselves be linearizable. In other words, the proofs are independent and they compose. Knowing that this is correct and knowing that this is correct means that a program that uses them both is guaranteed to be correct, which is very nice. That's not true for things like um, databases, where you need to reason about the system as a whole and have correctness proofs that encompass all things that could happen on all of the relations in your uh, database. Uh, the being able to reason separately about the implementations of data structures in your library is one of the really compelling advantages of linearizability as a definition. So let's go back to the Trever stack. Here's code for it. Um, pseudocode, and I've highlighted what turn out to be the linearization points in this code. In the push operation, when we perform a CAS that successfully changes the top of stack pointer to point to the new node, um, then push has linearized. And that instruction, which is atomic in the hardware, is the point at which the operation appears to take place. POP is slightly more complicated. If I go into POP and I look at the top of stack pointer and it's null because the stack is empty, I return. I never try a CAS. It's the read of the top of stack pointer that returns null that is the linearization point. On the other hand, if the top of stack read returns a non-null value and I want to do a POP and I read its next pointer and I do a CAS and the CAS succeeds, then the successful CAS is the linearization point. And this repeats if the CAS fails. So I read top of stack, it's not null. I try a CAS, but the CAS fails. So I go back and I read top of stack again, and now it's null. That's the linearization point. <laughs> so in POP, there's two instructions in the code that could be the linearization point, and which one of them is depends on the interleaving of operations during execution. So here's a case where we can identify linearization points in the code, but in the case of POP, um, which one of them is the one that actually matters depends on the execution and the interleaving of operations between threads. And it can get uh, significantly more complicated. We'll come back to that in a minute. For liveness, the other half of correctness, the good things eventually happen part, um, I gave a very general definition informally of non-blocking a few minutes ago that any realizable state of the system allows your thread to make progress if you get to run from that situation forward. Um, that's actually, when formalized a little bit, the weakest of the three main definitions of non-blocking progress. Uh, that's the one that's called obstruction-free. Basically, my operation will succeed in a bounded number of my steps if I get to execute all by myself and everybody stands still. Everybody else stands still. Often, I want something stronger than that. The strongest variant is weight-free, otherwise known as starvation-free. A weight-free operation is one where in a bounded number of my steps, I will successfully complete an operation regardless of what anybody else does. There is no interfering activity on any other thread's part that could prevent my operation from finishing in a bounded number of my steps. That's weight-free. That's the most desirable, strongest variant of, of forward progress guarantee, and also quite tricky to get in practice. Uh, the one that you see most often uh, in the real world is the intermediate case, the lock-free case. Uh, and the Trever stack, for instance, is lock-free. That says, in a bounded number of my steps, Somebody makes progress. Maybe not me, <laughs> but somebody does. Um, so it's live lock free. It's not possible for two threads to indefinitely get in each other's way in a lock free algorithm. 
So these are the three different levels of um, strength of non-blocking guarantee that we find in algorithms in the literature. Wait-free says my thread never starves. Lock-free says the system never starves, but my thread in principle might. The odds of that happening, you know, forever, my thread continually performing an operation and or trying to and not making progress, tend to be vanishingly small in practice in any real system. So most people are perfectly happy with lock-free algorithms. But if you're writing, say, um, real-time code and you need to have guarantees on how long an operation can take, then lock-free is not strong enough. And obstruction-free is the weakest version. Uh, that says it's possible that threads will keep getting in each other's way, and I probably need some out-of-band mechanism to notice when that's happening and temporarily hold somebody back so that the other one can make forward progress. And we'll see examples of all of these in a few minutes. Um, actually, I'll give some examples here. The fetch and add counter that we had earlier um, is wait-free if implemented with fetch and add. It's lock-free if implemented with CAS. So if I want to increment a counter and I use fetch and add, that will complete in straight-line code. But if I want to implement the counter and I have a loop with CAS, then the CAS can fail because some other thread incremented the counter, in which case I have to try again. So that would be just lock-free. Um, lock there, uh, there's a really lovely algorithm for double-ended queues that's obstruction-free that I hope to get to probably in the second half of today's talk. Um, and there are also several transactional memory systems implemented in software that are obstruction-free. Those are the, um, the ones you're most likely to bump into, but I'm mostly not talking about transactional memory today. So most published um, non-blocking algorithms are lock-free. The obstruction-free ones are sometimes significantly more elegant and simple. The weight-free ones are often, but not always, significantly more complex and uh, more space-consuming. Uh, as I mentioned, they may be useful for real-time applications, or uh, they may be very nice for large read-only operations. So imagine that I have a hash table, and I want inserts and removes and lookups to be fast, you know, O of 1 in a concurrent setting. Uh, but let's say my hash table also wants to uh, include some summary operations, like um, find the median element in the hash table. Let's imagine we have that operation. So somebody needs to be able to read the entire hash table, and I want that to be atomic with respect to the other operations. If I'm using a lock-free algorithm, odds are very good that anybody who tries to read everything in the hash table will, interf will be interfered with by some insert or remove. I'll get halfway through doing the reading and somebody will do an insert or a remove. And if I'm just doing a lock-free summary operation, I'll probably get killed by whatever they do. And so it's very likely that the summary operation that has to read everything will starve. So a weight-free summary operation may be really valuable even in a structure where other smaller operations are merely lock-free. Okay, um, yeah. On pre oh, yes, on this slide, uh, it's written uh, that wait free structures is useful for real-time apps. Do you mean here real-time in formal notion, like system I, I on aircraft or just interactive systems? Uh, I, I meant uh, the more formal sense. There is not, so this is, it's sort of speculation on the part of people who design non-blocking data structures, that weight-free variants might be useful in real-time systems because they are starvation-free. Um, on the other hand, they tend to be complicated enough that it's difficult to, um, to come up with the deadline meeting proofs. So in practice, there's not a lot of uptake of um, non-blocking structures in the real-time, the hard real-time community to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if the question makes sense, but are there any kind of scenarios in which lock-free as a guarantee is actually more desirable than weight-free? 
Uh, no. From a theoretical perspective, weight-free implies lock-free. So all obstruction-free algorithms are also lock-free and weight-free. All lock-free algorithms are also weight-free. Did I say that backwards? Yes, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly the other way around. <laughs> all weight-free, uh, thank you very much. All weight-free algorithms are also lock-free and obstruction-free. All lock-free algorithms are also obstruction-free. Yeah. Uh, do you know real application of weight-free algorithms in practice? I mean, not in theoretical sense, but maybe in some big company, and it was proven that they need really weight-free there. Well, I don't know about the need part, um, but a counter incremented with fetch and add is weight free, and yeah. <laughs> people do that a lot. Um, Beyond the I've got another example on the next slide that's weight free and quite straightforward. And then um, this is a field that's in motion, right? So a Respetronk's group at Technion has published a series of beautiful papers over the last decade that show how to take um, lock-free algorithms and mechanically transform them into weight-free algorithms in a way that is quite fast. It's not very space efficient. So there's some space blow up that you have to be willing to eat. Um, but there is not a significant performance hit for transforming lock-free algorithms into weight-free algorithms. So somebody who really wants the weight-free can use those constructions. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the most complex data structure that you know for which the weight-free algorithm exists? Well. That's a difficult question to answer because there are universal constructions that can give you a weight-free implementation of anything for which you have a correct sequential implementation. Um, they're not fast. That's, they're not practical, but they exist. So we can give you a bound on how long any thread um, would need to run in order to finish its operation for an arbitrary shared data structure. It's just not a very attractive bound. Um, in terms of a practical weight-free algorithm, um, I would say some of the um, things that, that Arez's group developed as demonstrations of their construction uh, are practical. But, um, you know, they require space proportional not only to the data in the data structure, but also the number of concurrently active threads. So, uh, you know, if you have say, a hash table where every bucket is a separate non-blocking data structure, and the expected size of every bucket is O of 1, and you turn that into the expected size of every bucket is O of T, where T is the maximum number of concurrent threads in your system, then you're probably not happy. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, there isn't an easy answer to the question. Thank you. Let me. Um, let me give a simple example of uh, a weight-free data structure that illustrates not only um, what weight freedom may require or involve, but also why linearization points can be tricky to identify. This is not probably an algorithm that you would actually want to use, but it's a very easy one to understand. It's a counter, and it has an increment operation and a read operation. Those are the only two methods. I want to be able to read the current value of the counter, and I want to be able to add one to it. I don't necessarily want to be able to add anything else, just one. <laughs> okay? So we're going to implement this with an array, and every thread has one slot of the array. And I will increment the counter by incrementing my slot in the array. And I can actually do this with no CASs, just loads and stores they'll need to be atomic loads and stores. But um, to increment the counter, I will read my value, add one to it, and write it back. Nobody else writes my counter, so there's no danger of getting the wrong value. And if I want to read the counter, I will scan the array and add up all the entries. And that's it. So the increment operation is clearly a bounded number of steps. Read, add one, and write. 
the read operation is also a bounded number of steps. It's O of T, where there's T threads and T slots in the array. I read all the way down the array, and I add up all the elements. And how do I know that this is linearizable? Well, consider the span of time. The, the, the write is easy, right? The increment is easy. Um, the point at which I store the new value is the linearization point for, um, for my increment. But the read is a little bit trickier. There's this span of time between when I call the read and start adding up elements and the point at which I return. Somewhere in that span of time between my call and return, I would like to linearize. I would like there to be some point in between there at which my operation appears to happen instantaneously, even though I'm adding up all these different things. If my linearization point is before all of the increments with which I overlap, that is, increments whose call and return are interleaved with my call and return in the concurrent history. If my operation linearizes before any of those overlapping operations, then I ought to get the sum of the elements in the array at the point at which I made the call. If my operation linearizes at the very end, just before it returns, and linearizes after all of the overlapping operations, then I ought to get the sum that includes all of those operations that I overlapped with. And if you think about it for a bit, you realize that any value I might get in practice by adding up these elements where other threads are incrementing them as I go along has to be between those two bounds. It has to be at least as large as what was there when I made my initial call because those values were already in the array and they don't get smaller. And it has to be no larger than the value with all the operations that overlapped in time, but none of the operations that were yet to start when I returned. Clearly, I will get a sum between that low bound and that high bound, and all values between that low bound and that high bound are valid in some sequential history because every write to the array increments it by one. So every one of those values in between must occur in the sequential history. But this means that I might start down the array doing my reads, I get halfway down the array, I've read those, I haven't read any of those yet, and right as of this instant, you know, from God's perspective, there are three more elements out there that I haven't added in yet. Um, and then some other threads come along and start incrementing the things that I already read. And at some point, the ones who are incrementing the things that I already read and I'm not going to look at again, will bring the total up to what I would have if I finished reading the array right now. And that becomes my linearization point. I will end up linearizing when some other thread comes and increments something that I already read, and I haven't even looked at the, at the other elements in the array yet. So there is no way I can look at the code and say, that's the linearization point. In the actual history, I will linearize at a place where I didn't even execute the instruction. Somebody else did. But they brought the total to the value that I am eventually going to return. So we, that's a very informal, hand-wavy argument about why the value that I get by adding up everything in the array is the right value in some sequential history that respects the call and return order that respects the semantics of the data structure, and that respects the program order in every thread. But the, the linearization points can only be identified by retroactively, retrospectively reasoning over the history if somebody gives it to you. And there are much more complicated algorithms out there where reasoning about the linearization points is equally or more complex. So, when you're lucky, you can look at your code and say that, that instruction right there in the source code, that's the linearization point. But there are algorithms in which it's nowhere near that easy to identify the places where the operation appears to happen instantaneously. All right? Question. Can you reference uh, white paper or textbook where uh, your reasoning is formally proved? Ah, uh, good question. Um, 
Yeah, so there's a slightly less informal discussion of this in my book. There is a, a less, a, a yet less informal <laughs> uh, version in Herlihy and Shavit's textbook on the art of multiprocessor programming. Um, a formal proof that would satisfy a theoretician is undoubtedly in the literature somewhere, but I don't know where. There may be a reference to it in Near and um, Morris's book. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time here? Great. So, the next algorithm I want to talk about in the first half of today's presentation, which is mostly devoted to simple algorithms, is um, the first known correct non-blocking queue, which my student Magid Mihail uh, and I came up with back in the 1990s. This is a linked list queue, so it's unbounded. It has a head pointer and a tail pointer, which can be in separate words. They're accessed separately, and CASs are performed on them separately. And an empty queue has a single node in it called the dummy node. So when you initialize a queue, it looks like this. You have a head and a tail pointer. They both point at this dummy node. And, uh, and the fact that they both point at the same node means that the queue is empty. If the queue is non-empty, then there are additional nodes in it, labeled A through B here. The newest nodes are added at the tail. The oldest nodes are removed at the head. Um, there is still a dummy node. So there's always a dummy node in the queue. It's always the one closest to the head. Uh, and it's the only node when the queue is empty. And uh, as usual, NQ adds at the tail and DQ removes at the head. So if we want to perform an NQ operation, uh, it's actually the trickier of the two operations because we have to link this new node A into the linked list and we have to make tail point at it. And we can't do both of those with a single instruction. So we need to find a way to identify a single linearization point despite the fact that we need to update two different things in the data structure. So the first step of an NQ is, well, the zeroth step is to read the tail pointer and the head pointer if necessary and the next pointer of the last node in the queue. Once you've done that, the first interesting step is to CAS the tail pointer to point to your new node. So in the dummy node, I had in lighter blue there a nil next pointer and I'm going to use a CAS to change that to point to my new node which I have already initialized to contain the data that I want to be in the node and to have its own next pointer set to null. That's the linearization point. And after I have cas the next pointer of the last node in the queue to point to my new node, then I use a second CAS to move the tail pointer to point at the new node. That second CAS is clean up. And the need to do it can be recognized by any thread that comes along and discovers that the tail pointer points at a node whose next pointer is not nil. So if the tail pointer points at something that has a non-trivial successor, then we need to do some cleanup, and any thread can do the cleanup on behalf of any other thread. So you have this interesting point in the code at which you say, I'm going to CAS the last node's next pointer to point to my new node, and if that CAS fails, I'm going to start over again. And then later on, I have a point where I say, I'm going to CAS the tail pointer to point at my new node, and if that CAS fails, I don't care because the only way it can fail is if somebody already did it on my behalf, I can just return. Now that's a case where I have to use compare exchange strong in C++, because I'm not going to retry it if it fails, but I have to know that the only reason it could fail is because somebody did it on my behalf. A spurious failure would be bad there, a, a load link store conditional not in a loop, so I need the compare exchange strong. The notion of helping of noticing that some other operation is in progress and there's cleanup that needs to be done on its behalf is a very common recurring theme in non-blocking data structures. And we'll see helping all over the place. Um, it's almost, but not completely, ubiquitous in weight-free algorithms. Uh, usually, 
in a weight-free algorithm with any complexity, there's some point at which you discover that there's a thread in your way, and the only way for you to make progress is to get the other thread out of your way by doing its work for it. Uh, and that sort of helping is very common in the weight-free case, although we saw in the counter, uh, the weight-free counter a minute ago that we didn't need helping there. Yes? I'm also willing to repeat questions if we don't want to so pass the mic. Do you understand correctly that uh, in this case, when I'm the second thread and I'm going to, for example, DQ some element, so I'm, I'm going to read the tail, uh, and when I'm reading the tail and I see that element at the tail has non-null pointer to the next, it means that this is not really a tail, right? And I need to help by doing this uh, second CAS, right. uh, and if this CAS fails, it probably means that I can't decuse. I still cannot decue because no, 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 I still no. don't no, have no, the you pain. can. So let, let's think through this. Um, for starters, the DQ operation actually doesn't care if there's an NQ that hasn't finished as long as there's more than one element in the queue. Um, so for a DQ operation, which is on the next slide, uh, I will look at head and I'll look at tail, and if they're different, then I know that I can safely DQ, and I don't care whether the tail needs cleaning up or not. Uh, because if they're different, it means there's at least one node between me and the tail, and the only way it can go away is through a DQ, and I'm doing a DQ, and I'm going to notice conflicting DQs anyway. If I'm doing an NQ, and I discover that the tail is out of date, it points to a node whose next pointer is non-null, then I have to help that NQ before I can NQ. If my attempt to help fails, that means that somebody has done that cleanup and beat me to it. You could have an arbitrary number of threads all trying to do the cleanup. One of them will succeed, the others will realize that somebody succeeded and it wasn't them. So if I'm trying to do an NQ, I read the tail, its next pointer is not null, I will try to do the cleanup. Whether I succeed or fail, I'll look again to see whether the next pointer of the thing that tail points at is non-null. And if it is non-null, that means there's another cleanup that I have to help with because somebody came along and did an NQ right in the middle of my operation. And I could do this indefinitely. That's why it's lock-free and not wait-free. But every time I have to start over again, I know that someone did an NQ. So the whole system is lock-free. Somebody made progress. But an individual thread could, in principle, starve and spend its entire life helping other threads do NQs. <laughs> okay? Um, so two CASs to do an NQ, the second of which is clean up and can be helped by anybody and doesn't have to be in a loop. The DQ works at the other end. You read the head pointer, you read the next pointer of the dummy node, you read the data value in the node that the dummy node points at if there is one. Of course, if the dummy node's next pointer is null, then you just return and say, I can't DQ because the queue is empty. Um, in the successful case, you'll read head, you'll read the next pointer of the dummy node, you'll read the value out of the first non-dummy node in the queue, then you'll use a CAS to change the head pointer to point from the dummy node to point to the node that you just read the value out of. And that CAS is the linearization point at which the operation is said to have taken place. Um, then you can discard the old dummy node, which you don't need anymore, and the node out of which you read the value becomes the dummy node. Notice that you had to read the value out of that node before you did the CAS, because once you do the CAS, any other thread is allowed to do a DQ and to remove and discard the node from which you want the value. So you need to read that value before you do your CAS that enables somebody else to pull your node out and throw it away. This three-step sequence of I read head, I read the next pointer of the dummy node, I read the value out of the node after that, then I go back and try to do a CAS, which involves implicitly reading head again. 
that three-step sequence uh, we call an atomic snapshot. And to reason formally about the correctness of this algorithm, which I am not going to attempt to do on stage, um, to reason formally about it, we need to argue that if any of those three things that I read, head, next, value, if any of those changes, it changes in an order where head changes first. So if I read all three, and then I go back and read head again, and it is the same in a load link store conditional or counted pointer sense, so it's really the same, then I know that all three of those values were simultaneously correct. And my operation can successfully um, happen. And that depends on knowing that any updates happen in order. And the thing I'm rereading is the first thing that would be changed by anybody who was changing any of the three values. So in some sense, I've, in this particular limited case, I've got a CAS that changes head to point to the next node in the queue atomically with known values occurring in the next pointer of the dummy node and the value of the node after it. So it's kind of a multi-word compare, single word um, exchange that works only because I've demonstrated in the algorithm that things change in order and that say the value that I want cannot change without head also changing. And the fact that my CAS notices that head has not changed means that none of the other things have changed either. So that's the cue. But I've glossed over malloc and free. And I can't really do that. We need to talk about how the memory management works because there's this problem in a concurrent data structure that's non-blocking that does not occur in a concurrent data structure that's lock-based. If I grab a lock on a data structure to protect my operation and while I'm holding the lock, I allocate or free nodes that are only accessed through the data structure protected by the lock, then I know that no other thread can be looking at the things that I'm doing memory management on while I'm doing the memory management because I hold the lock. But in a non-blocking algorithm, I may try to especially free something that somebody else might be looking at maybe in an operation that conflicts with mine, so eventually it's going to discover that it has a problem and it's going to start over again. But before it notices that there's a problem and has to start over again, it may try to dereference a pointer in a node that I've freed and used for something else. And by the time they actually try to read the pointer, you know, it's been replaced by a floating point number in some completely different data structure and they seg fault. We've got to worry about that because it's a real concern in practice. So imagine in the queue, for instance, that thread one reads the head pointer, thread two comes along and removes and frees the dummy node, as the picture at the bottom suggests, and reuses it for something else. And now the bits that used to be a pointer pointing to the next node in the queue are part of the bits of a floating point number. Uh, and then thread one tries to read the next pointer. It could easily seg fault. Or it could read an arbitrary place in your address space. Uh, and you could get essentially any kind of erroneous behavior that you can imagine in your program. So one way around this starts with using counted pointers. We make head and tail be counted pointers, and then there's no way that um, we can get the ABA problem on head, where we read head, we read the dummy next, we read the value in the node after that, we go back and, and the head pointer appears to be the same. That won't happen if we use counted pointers. Um, but we still have the problem of we read head, we read the next pointer of the dummy node, or we're about to read the next pointer of the dummy node, and somebody comes along and uses it for a different purpose. Counted pointers won't solve that. For that, we have to make sure that whenever we read something we think is a pointer and we dereference it, there is zero chance that the pointer will actually be bits of something else because somebody did a concurrent free. We still got to deal with that problem. And we can do that in the 
cue here by, in addition to having counted pointers, we have what's called a type preserving allocator. This is another theme that you'll see in a number of non-blocking data structures. It says once a cue node, always a cue node. If I take something from malloc and I use it as a cue node in some cue, if I ever free it, I put it back into a special pool of Q nodes. So it'll never get used for any other type. That means that the field that was the next pointer will always be a next pointer. It might point to an arbitrary Q node in an arbitrary Q, but we know that it points at a Q node. Yes? Well, what, I'm not positive I'm understanding the question. I think you're asking um, why this algorithm can't just reuse its own nodes. No, no, okay. Oh, I, I want it to not do so. So I'm trying to come up with a special purpose allocator to solve the problem that I have in this algorithm. So, I, pardon? I, I, I think the question is, um, why is it that I don't want the allocator to reuse the node for something else? Is that right? No? Okay. <laughs> Microphone would help. Sorry. Okay. So, the question was, is, uh, that some allocators can uh, reuse the memory of uh, the nodes, for example, to store some pointers to internal data structures. So I think that in this case, these allocators will not also fit because they can corrupt the memories so, uh, in some way. Yeah, any allocator that once I free a node might put some other bit pattern into a pointer field would be bad. Okay. So I, I cannot safely use any allocator that might overwrite the next pointer with some non-pointer bit pattern. I need to know that even after I've freed a node, if somebody else is still looking at it and they try to use that field as a pointer, dereferencing it will not cause bad things to happen. In, in particular, it will not be an invalid address, and the thing that it points at will still be a Q node so that it can go on and read the value out of whatever it points at. And that's what the type preserving allocator will do. So you can make this algorithm usable in practice, and this is a commonly used technique for this Q by using counted pointers for head and tail and using a type preserving allocator, which just says when I free, I put something onto a linked list of Q nodes. And then when I need to allocate a node, I take something out of that linked list of Q nodes and use it. And in, in fact, a Treber stack makes a really nice list of Q nodes. <laughs> uh, not only is it non blocking, which is great, um, it's also um, um, locality preserving so that the Q node I get is likely still in my cache. <laughs> um, just, just to finish my train of thought, uh, I know with this type preserving allocator that even a deallocated Q node um, will still have a real pointer in the field that I might dereference, and if it's non-null, the thing it points at was also a Q node, and the value field can be read and, and won't seg fault. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Am I right that there is no such problem in systems with garbage collector? Right. If, you have a, if you're doing this in Java, then you're fine. If you have a tracing garbage collector, then you don't have to worry about the memory allocation at all. Um, because as long as some other thread has a reference to um, a Q node that you've freed, it won't get reused for something else. Uh, and by freed, of course, in Java, I mean you've taken it out of the data structure and stopped looking at it. <laughs> Notice, however, that garbage collection in every Java virtual machine that I know of is blocking. There are locks in the garbage collector. So um, 
in some sense, it isn't a non-blocking algorithm anymore if you consider the entirety of the system. Uh, as long as you can keep um, making nodes inaccessible without running out of memory, then yes, it's non-blocking, but as soon as your allocator runs out of memory, then the system is going to acquire some locks in order to, um, to clean up the garbage. Yeah. Um, just want to make sure I understand correctly. So does that mean that from the rest of the system's perspective, it's kind of like a memory leak in a sense, where if you use some memory for a node, it can never be returned to like right. the rest? So if I have a program that allocates 37 million Q nodes and then frees them all and never needs any Q nodes again, then yeah, I just leaked 37 million Q nodes. Um, it's not very likely that your system actually looks like that. I mean, generally, you have kind of a steady state where you can have a type-preserving allocator, and you know you allocate from that pool when you need Q nodes, and you allocate from elsewhere when you need something else. Um, if you happen to have that bizarre system that needs a lot of Q nodes and then doesn't need them anymore, you could implement some sort of blocking, stall the world when you reach the point at which you don't need lots and lots of them anymore, and you know you, you wait till you've got quiescence, and then you can clean it all up. Yeah. Uh, am I right is that in this algorithm uh, allocator and so the allocation must be log free, and you should include it in your algorithm? <laughs> must is too strong a word. <laughs> Uh, it's nice if it's lock-free. Then you know that the entire system is lock-free. But um, if you're programming, say, in Java, and this is an eminently useful algorithm, and it's in the Java standard library. It's the concurrent linked queue class in Java Util Concurrent. Um, if you're doing an NQ, um, and you need to allocate node A there, you're doing the allocation before you're in anybody else's way. So you can think of it as, I do the allocate before I really start my non-blocking operation. Um, so in some sense, you can not worry about the fact that the allocator might have a lock inside of it. And when you do a free in Java, it really just means, I return, I don't have a pointer to this anymore, and eventually the garbage collector can find it. So again, my thread can keep going as long as the system has not run out of memory. So it's quite usable in a system that has memory allocation and garbage collection with locks built into it. Uh, it, it means that your code does not ever stall because somebody was preempted while working on the queue. And your memory allocator is almost certainly designed so that the odds of somebody holding a lock in new and getting preempted and the whole rest of the world stopping are infinitesimally small, right? If your Java virtual machine was vulnerable to stalling the entire system because you preempted a thread that was in the middle of a new, then you'd have a bad Java virtual machine. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes before the break, so timing is going pretty well. This was a solution that we can use for memory allocation in um, the MNS queue. So let me describe one more basic building block algorithm, uh, variants of which are incorporated into all sorts of other more complicated data structures. Uh, this is singly linked sorted lists. A very fundamental data structure, and the algorithm here is due to Tim Harris from about 2001 um, with an update by Magid Mikhail uh, shortly thereafter. It's tempting, and this is how Tim starts describing the algorithm in his paper, it's tempting to think that you ought to be able to do single word CASs to update a singly linked list. So in the first picture there, I want to insert node C um, I have a pointer from B to D, one CAS that moves that pointer to point to C instead, where C has been pre-initialized to point to D, ought to be a nice linearization point for an insert in a singly linked list. And similarly, in the second picture, 
if I want to remove node C, and I have a pointer from B to C and a pointer from C to D, I ought to be able to just change B's next pointer to point to D instead of C, and that will remove C. That's all true, except that if inserts and removes are happening at the same time, bad stuff can occur. So for instance, let's say that my list has three nodes in it, A, B, and D, and thread one comes along and wants to insert C. So it pre-initializes this new node C that has the right value in it and has a next pointer that points to D, and nobody else knows about this yet. So thread one is getting ready to do the CAS that will insert C into the list. And it reads the next pointer from B to D. So I've drawn that in red for the moment. Uh, and now T1 is ready to do its CAS, but T2 comes along and decides it wants to delete B. So it reads the next pointer in A, which I've drawn in red again. Then it CASes A to point to D instead in order to perform its delete of B. And then thread one wakes up again and CASes B to point to C. And we've not only deleted B from the list, but we've lost A. This is not the only bad thing that can happen. It's an example of how inserts and removes can interfere with each other. And the real problem is that thread one to insert C wanted to change B's next pointer. And thread two in order to remove B wanted to change A's next pointer. And A's next pointer and B's next pointer are in different places. So we have conflicting operations, this insert and this remove, that are performing their CASs on different locations. And that doesn't work. So Tim Harris's insight was that we can make both of those operations work on B's next pointer, and neither one of them work on A's next pointer. They're both going to linearize, the two conflicting operations are both going to linearize on a CAS of the same word. And here's how we do it. The delete operation to delete C puts a tag onto the next pointer of C. And uh, tagging of pointers is a very common theme that you'll see in lots of non-blocking algorithms. It leverages the fact that pointers almost always point to an even address. So the low order bit is always zero in any valid pointer. And in fact, in most systems, the bottom few bits of a pointer are all zeros because all of my blocks that I'm allocating out of the uh, heap are aligned to a, a double word or a quad word. So the few bits at the bottom of a pointer are always zero, which means I could use them for something else as long as I always clear them before I actually dereference the pointer. This works great in C and C++. It does not work in Java. <laughs> You can't change pointers by tagging their low-order bits in Java. So if you want to use a pointer tagging technique in Java, you have to introduce an extra level of indirection, which is kind of inefficient. There are a few algorithms in Java util concurrent that do that, but for the most part, pointer tagging algorithms are confined to C and C++ and other languages that allow you to mess with bit patterns. Anyway, assuming that I'm working in C and C++, I can delete C by marking its next pointer. And that mark is the linearization point. As soon as I tag the pointer from C to D, C is logically no longer in the list. And all threads traversing the list will treat C as if it were not there. So the delete operation has finished. And now to link it out is just cleanup. So we remove C with a CAS as cleanup, and any other thread can do that, just as in the MNS queue, any other thread could change the tail pointer to point at the newly inserted or enqueued node. So tagging forces a conflict with any concurrent insert that might be trying to put something between C and D, or, or between B and D. Um, we can't insert after C once C has been tagged. So the insert operation will decline to perform a CAS on a tagged pointer. Instead, it will do the cleanup on behalf of the delete, remove the node that had the tag next pointer, and start over again. Any thread can do that cleanup. And not only that, in Harris's original code, any thread could, um, could remove a succession of deleted nodes with one CAS. So Tim suggested this as a performance optimization in his paper where he first introduced the algorithm. He said, when you delete a node, just mark the next pointer as, as tagged so the node is logically deleted and leave it in the list for a while. 
And we'll wait until we have several of them that are in a row and all are marked as deleted. And then we'll do one cast to link them all out. Which is a nice idea, uh, but it turns out to interact badly with memory management. We'll get to that in a minute. So he was saying if you have a language with garbage collection, then this is the way to go. We'll lazily leave the things in the list. We'll remove them in batches. Um, Magid Michal came along and pointed out that this doesn't work correctly with memory management. Um, that if you don't have a garbage collected language, there's problems, and I'll explain in a minute what those problems are. Um, and he suggested two solutions. One solution is very much like the one in the uh, queue that we saw a minute ago. We use counted pointers and um, a type preserving allocator. And that combination works in this algorithm just as it does in the queue. And so you can do singly linked non-blocking lists with counted pointers and a type preserving allocator. Um, but you can't delete lazily anymore. And in particular, you can't traverse a deleted node and then reason about what it points at. Because it's possible that after you moved into the deleted node, somebody else would physically link it out of the list, reuse the space for something else, and when you tried to follow the next pointer, bad things would happen. Uh, in particular, even with a type-preserving allocator, you might be linked into a different list. So you could get halfway down a list and without even realizing it, end up continuing your walk down a different list somewhere else in your code. That would be bad even with a type-preserving allocator. So we need something different, and, and that is uh, to stop doing the lazy deletion. So it turns out to be enough to say, any time I see a tagged next pointer, I have to remove it immediately. I cannot look at the next node at that point. Um, if I take the tagged nodes out immediately, then I never hop lists. The counted pointers and the type-preserving allocator are adequate. Uh, alternatively, I can use what's called hazard pointers for memory management, um, and mm, I'm probably not going to cover that before the break. Okay, uh, let's do a little bit of a tease for that. Hazard pointers are a general technique for safe manual memory management in non-blocking data structures. Uh, they're due to Magid Mikhail. They're supported by a lot of different libraries and systems. Uh, there's support for hazard pointers built into the Linux kernel code at this point. So if you want to add data structures to the Linux kernel, you can use the library for hazard pointers. Uh, there's an implementation of hazard pointers, I believe, in Boost. Uh, there's an implementation in the library that Facebook uses for all its internal um, uh, data center operations. Uh, they're all over the place. Um, the key idea is that whenever I have a pointer to something that might be deleted by somebody else, I publicly advertise the fact that I'm using a pointer to it. So there's some global place where I write down copies of any pointers that I'm holding in registers. And then anybody who wants to delete a node waits to actually free it until none of the global pointers point at it. You make sure that none of the global pointers point at this thing and it's already been linked out of the data structure so nobody can create a pointer to it in the future. Then you know that you can safely reclaim it. That's the key idea in hazard pointers and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more after our break. <laughs> 